Welcome back, everyone. I uh, hope you had a, a great break and were able to connect with a few people through the, the networking tab. Um, and for those of you who are just joining us, my name is Sean Meister, and I'm your virtual host for the day. Uh, welcome to the uh, Europe Markets Forum. And today, our focus is on doing business in the Netherlands and Belgium. Before the break, we heard from the Canadian Trade Commissioner teams uh, in both the Netherlands and Belgium. Uh, if you missed those sessions or any session throughout the program, don't worry, as this entire uh, forum will be available for on-demand viewing uh, beginning on June 10th. You can access all recorded presentations and downloadable materials starting on June 10th by using your same login and password that you used to access the platform this morning. You can come back and visit as many times as you want. Now, without further delay, uh, and if everyone can make sure that they are in the, the correct uh, session, uh, so in your agenda on the left, you'll see a live, uh, red live uh, above the Benelux market, your unexpected powerhouse, so make sure you're clicked into there. And without further delay, we're going to move right into our next spe speaker, uh, Sieb Hoogstra. Sieb is the founder of Colors Inc. and has over 25 years experience in the foreign direct investment and trade support and corporate location assessment industries. Throughout his career, Sieb has worked on a large variety of international projects, both for government and private clients, enabling him to gain a deep insight and expertise in inward investment and trade policies and corporate expansion strategies. Sieb is based in Brussels, from where he covers the Benelux countries. The combination of international experience and an in-depth knowledge of the Benelux business environment gives him an advantage in finding solutions for his clients. Besides the direct contacts with companies, his network in the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg consists of the key industry and trade association organizations, chambers of commerce, and government agencies. Sieb tells us the presentation will filter down into the way the Dutch and Belgians do business to provide Canadian companies from the Atlantic Canadian region the tools to successfully enter the Benelux market. It will address cultural differences, routes to market, as well as unifying factors that connect Canada, the Netherlands, and Belgium. And a quick reminder to click on the poll tab uh, to cast your vote and then come back to the video so you can see Sieb's presentation. And now without any further delay, over to you, Sieb. Thank you for the introduction. And I will be happy to take your questions after my presentation. During the, ne uh, the next 30 minutes or so, I will give you more information on the Benelux and doing business here. The Benelux uh, consists, as the name suggests, of three countries, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. These are three small countries in size, but big in performance and impact. Therefore, we call this the unexpected powerhouse. In this presentation, we concentrate on the main two countries, the Netherlands and Belgium. With just over half a million inhabitants, Luxembourg is quite small, although they have some strong sectors and are an important financial center. As a market, potential market, they are though less interesting. Before we start, just a little bit about OCO. OCO is a consulting firm specialized in trade and investment support for companies and governments throughout the world. The company is headquartered out of Belfast, Northern Ireland, and has 17 locations worldwide. I myself, I'm based in Brussels with, uh, as the Benelux partner office. And my colleague Marit, who will be with you in the Q&A afterwards, is based out of The Hague in the Netherlands. OCO provides services to governments for which we do a lot of investment attraction work and support of their trade programs as we are doing at the moment for Atlantic Canada. Other clients we have are throughout the world from Thailand to Florida and from France all the way down to Australia. Then of course, we help companies expanding internationally, both through market entry support as well as helping them with a soft landing uh, of their investments abroad. And finally, we work a lot with intermediaries uh, that work in the field of international business, such as banks, industry organizations, and tax and law firms, which help us 
to support the companies that we're working with. The holistic approach as mentioned here on this slide means that we want to support companies throughout the whole process from start to finish and even beyond. This is what I think makes this EMDP program so interesting for companies that participate. It's not just a matchmaking program whereby you get a list of possible partners or clients and then off you go, but we start up with thorough research Research to make sure you get an insight in the European market, the industry, and the best opportunities there are for your company. We discuss then what market entry strategy we want to pursue and where to focus on. We can help you build the proposition and localize it for the specific markets you're targeting. Based on this, our in market teams build a long list of potential targets. And we review together to make sure we're on the right track. And only then our local teams will start reaching out to companies to get you on the, at the table with them. And if you wish, of course, we can continue supporting you also after the EMDP program. We all know that COVID had a serious impact on international business. Zoom and Teams have replaced a lot of the travel, the trade shows and the meetings, uh, and we all hope they come back. Some industries were heavily hit, whereas others benefited from the pandemic. In the program that we already did over the last year, we noticed that companies still are interested, and many of them are preparing for a post-COVID era. The companies have become, in some cases, more risk averse. And it's crucial that if you get the possibility to pitch your product or service, you're able to show your USP. And you will need to follow up and have the resources available for your EU program. Sorry. We see more and more hopeful signs or COVID ending, hopefully. Just here in Belgium, where I'm based, the terraces opened last weekend and the vaccination rates here are now 40% and the same for the Netherlands. So there is light at the end of the tunnel. But some industries were only able to survive because of the large amount of government support. And what will happen when that falls away? Brexit also had an effect although smaller than some had foreseen and even maybe hoped. The impact for the Benelux is important because the UK is one of the largest export markets for Benelux companies. But most exporters either cope with the situation or have found alternative markets. We've also seen that many British companies and foreign companies based in Britain uh, have set up a warehouse or office now in the Benelux to avoid all the problems, customs problems in the UK. Okay, let's start now about the Benelux itself. Founded in 44, but already in 58, a U economic union. It was a kind of test case, you can say, for the European Union. It was since 1958, a full economic union with open borders and free movement of services and trade. And as mentioned, the three countries are relatively small in size. I just checked and the size is comparable to New Brunswick, but the Netherlands have 17 million people, Belgium almost 12 million people, and Luxembourg with over half a million people. Altogether, there are about 30 million people in the area the size of New Brunswick, which has, as I understand, not even 800,000 people. This means, of course, that it's a densely populated area, especially if you know that part of Belgium, especially the part of Belgium and the northeastern part of the Netherlands are much less populated. So a very large concentration. Benelux also has a very high GDP and the three small countries together have the same GDP 
as a whole of Eastern Europe, including Ukraine and Belarus, the, the green areas on the map uh, on the slide. Historically, these have always been trading nations because of course they have a very small market internally. So they, and they were at the sea. So they were trading abroad. This already started in the middle ages when Bruges was the business center of Europe. And this shifted afterwards to the north when Amsterdam became the most important economic capital in Europe and in some part of the world. So over the ages, there have been real trading countries with both also very large colonies that made them very, very rich. The Netherlands had Indonesia as a colony and Belgium had Congo in Africa as a colony. This wealth was well used and still the three countries have some of the highest disposable incomes with Luxembourg even as a champion. As you can see on the map, on the plan, uh, Luxembourg, I think it's number two or number three in the world even with the highest income. And the thing is they don't even, not, not only have a high income, they're also willing to spend it. And especially on quality and on innovation. So the Benelux can be a great test bed for your products or your technologies. And if it works in the Benelux, it will be work in the rest of Europe. So what makes the Benelux, what are the characteristics that are important? With two of the largest ports, European ports, Rotterdam and Antwerp, the Benelux is the ideal logistic hub. The two ports are less than 100 kilometers apart from each other and are even connected by pipelines. They also have many connections, of course, with the East Coast of America and with Canada. The two main airports in Belgium and the Netherlands are Schiphol in Amsterdam and Zaventem in Brussels. Amsterdam has very good global connections. And although that's a bit less with Zaventem, Zaventem, because of the European Union, has a great intra-European network. And it's also the hub for flights to Africa. And even there, Luxembourg also has an important airport, but that's more a cargo airport, but quite an important one with Cargo Lux as the main carrier. And the two ports are, of course, not just to serve the two local markets. In fact, the two ports are, in fact, the ports of Germany. And even more, they don't only serve Germany, but large parts of France and a very large part deep into the rest of Europe. So all these connections, the rail, the roads, the shipping, the waterways, the flights, all this makes the Benelux the ideal gateway to Europe. It's also the fourth exporter in the world, the Benelux combined. So after us, China and Germany. And the three countries combined are also the fourth largest retail market in Europe. With this relatively large and diverse population, which is also living on a crossroad between Northern Europe, the Northern European culture, I could say, and the Southern European culture, it's an ideal test bed for your product and your technologies. And they're open to innovation and new products and technologies. One other thing is being in the Netherlands is also kind of neutral. And what I mean with that is to say that if you're a company in Germany, if you set up in Germany, you're a German company, you're considered a German company. If you're set up in France, you're considered a French company. Whereas if you're set up in Belgium or the Netherlands or Luxembourg, you're a European company. It's more neutral. So it could be of interest. We will now focus more on the separate countries and uh, well, what's the perception of the Netherlands? 
And I think when you've been to Amsterdam, uh, you recognize the pictures here in the slides. For those that don't recognize it, left is a coffee shop. And a coffee shop in Amsterdam is a place where you can't get a cup of coffee, but a lot of other things, of course. And right is the red light district in Amsterdam, which is one of the main tourist attractions. Some other stereotypes for the Netherlands are, of course, the, the, the fields with tulips, the windmills, the cheese, and wooden shoes, and the bicycles, which are everywhere. Maybe you know, but they're estimated about 25 to 30 million bicycles in the land, Netherlands, with that's more than the inhabitants. And although this is all true, of course, to a certain extent, there's much more that you should know about. Like I said, the Netherlands, it's, it's a country of traders. And the good thing about it is they're used to doing international business. And with such a densely populated country, infrastructure is of, is of course crucial to keep everything working and to get people moving. And as we saw with the port and the airport and the hinterland, it's the ideal distribution hub. And we've seen they have the port, they have everything, but it also means they have the whole ecosystem behind it, such as the warehousing, the logistics, the trucking, the customs, all is available and ready to work with you. Another thing you might not know is the Netherlands is the second largest exporter of agri-food in the world after the USA. So probably you know the Dutch vegetables, tomatoes, apples, pears, all famous around the world. Good, good thing also is, is that the government is quite enterprise friendly. In some cases, a bit too friendly because for a lot of people, people consider the Netherlands as a tax haven. And the last part, you might know the saying, God created the world, but the Dutch created the Netherlands. And with a large part of the country below sea level, it is of course necessary to keep all the dikes in order and to build and construct all this infrastructure. A little more about the Dutch culture. And as the Dutch shaped their land, the land shaped the Dutch mindset and approach to tomorrow's challenges. Working together and innovation are very much in the Dutch DNA. The so-called, what you see there, polar model means that people try to work together to come to a common goal. And you will find it throughout the Dutch society in government, but also in business and even in, in, in normal life. And normalcy, yeah, there's a, there's a Dutch saying which says, act normal, you're strange enough as it is. So please stay normal. And just for your information, the guy on the bike there, that's our prime minister. And this is not a photo op, this is really his daily routine. He comes to work which is the little tower in the back on his bicycle. That's normalcy. One thing where they don't act normal, the Dutch people, is when it comes to their national pride, and then especially when it's about sports. And maybe you've seen the, uh, the Orange Legion, as they call themselves, at the Olympics or in the football stadium. And then another thing is the, the Dutch directness. Uh, this is Dutch people can be quite direct. And uh, this picture, yeah, it, it, it was a video, but it, this guy is a, the world speed skating champion who just won his gold medal at the Vancouver Olympics. And he was asked by a American reporter to introduce himself and tell what he has, has done right now. And he just said, are you stupid? It might not be so polite, but you know where you are. Some other characteristics, and these, these relate also a bit to business, of course. Uh, Dutch people, the normal working day, working hours are 36 to 40 hours per week uh, with a high productivity. 
And what is special for the Netherlands is that there's a lot of part-time work. Both men and women work a lot of part-time. Lunches at work are simple and short. Um, something, and we'll get to that later, where the Belgians make a lot of fun about. You don't have to worry that you have to learn the Dutch language because 90% of the people will speak English and you can talk to them in, in your own language. One thing is that people like a good life work life balance. And it's very common, for instance, on Friday afternoon that you start the weekend with your colleagues at the so-called borrow, which is just means drink. When we then go to Belgium, we go back to the stereotypes. And of course, you all know chocolates and beer, the best in the world, by the way. Antwerp still is the global center for diamond trade and cutting of the special stones. Fries are the Belgian staple food. So it's not French fries, it's fries or Belgian fries. And Belgium, more specifically Brussels, is still the capital of Europe. But did you know that Antwerp is the second largest chemical cluster after Houston in Texas? And did you know that Belgium is the largest exporter of frozen potato, potatoes and potato products, and also one of the leading global exporters of frozen vegetables? And around the University of Ghent, uh, there has been a uh, biotech cluster that has developed and that has become a leading hub for crop protection. And maybe you've heard about it, but now with COVID, Belgium is also right in the middle of the vaccine production with the largest vaccine production in the world, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, and a, a large uh, vaccine production site of Pfizer. And all those small in size, uh, Belgium is also a little bit complicated. I myself, I'm Dutch, I'm Dutch, and, but I live here now for 30 years in Brussels, and I can confirm this. The three official languages, Flemish, which is Dutch, French, and German. There's a federal government with four independent regions, Flanders, Wallonia, Brussels, and the German region each with their own government. And besides that, you have some regional bodies that also have a say. And this situation has resulted in, in now with COVID, for instance, that there were nine, nine ministers that were involved in the healthcare response. It's complicated, but to be honest, if you're here as a foreign company, the impact will be less, uh, but you, you still have to be aware. Some of the Belgian culture. Um, I think one of the things Belgians tend to be a bit on their guard before they will open up. At first they might be reserved and it's a bit difficult to get close. Very friendly, but reserved. And they tend to stay around, as they say, stay around the church tower. So a lot of them, will not move for work, but will commute and commute for long hours. But you want to stay around the church town. But they do like a good party and often in family circles. And then they like to drink uh, good food. That's crucial. here. Then on business in the Netherlands. The Netherlands is really a cluster country whereby companies, government, and knowledge institutes work together for a common goal, the so-called triple helix. There's also a very flat hierarchy. Everybody can give his opinion, and during meetings, everybody is also expected to contribute. It should be, however, straight to the point, constructive, and the results that are reached are supposed to be followed up on. It's therefore necessary, if you're in a meeting, to come with facts and solutions. Some more common ways of doing business in the, in the, in the Netherlands you find on this slide. Uh, dress code, the wearing of ties has become almost obsolete in, in 
well, only in the very formal sectors and, and maybe with some elderly people, but um, the tie has disappeared for a large part. And the funny thing is this has started by Prince Klaus, which was the husband of the previous queen who had an official meeting once, threw out his tie and said, let's get rid of the thing. And after that, it disappeared. We already discussed the Dutch lunch, not much to say there. And one thing with the, the meetings, prepare them well. Don't try hard selling. It's more facts and honesty that name. And yes, with communication, we often think that when we're talking to each other that we, uh, that we understand each other, of course, but the communication style can differ and can be interpreted very differently. Famous is a, a Dutchman who gets to hear from his English boss that his idea is very interesting. A Dutchman that will think, uh, well, he likes my idea, whereas he just has been told that his, he can forget about it. But that indirectness is not used in the Netherlands. In the contrary, they're very direct. And that's one thing I think you have to understand. Don't take it as rude, but more as frank. Uh, it's a way to avoid misunderstanding. I say what I mean, and so you know exactly where I stand. And with a low level of hierarchy, there's quite an informal way of communication. You can use first names, maybe after a first introduction, but that's well accepted. In contrast to the Netherlands, in Belgium, the hierarchy is much larger, uh, a bit more the French style of operating, and the boss is the boss. Meetings are also much less direct. And I always say, I've, I've, I've been in both countries, in a Belgian meeting, everything is decided before and after the meeting and during the meeting, people shut up. Belgians are also masters in finding a compromise and working on having more strategic goals on the long term. Again, the Belgians also very good at the languages, bilingual at least, often trilingual. Don't try to get involved in the differences between the Flemish and the Walloon. They can do it perfectly themselves. Dress codes is more or less as in the Holland. The big difference is the lunch, the food. Belgians like their food and a good, often warm meal is common. And for business, business lunches, uh, with clients, that can be a, a full meal with alcohol, so uh, be aware of that. And they tend to be more indirect, like I said, and they also think Dutch are loudmouth. They communicate really in between the French and the Dutch. They, they're not that direct like a Dutchman, but they're not so philosophic and pompous as, as French can be. And as I said, it's more about a long-term solution, which also means that decisions can take a bit longer. So there will be a lot of meetings. People like to discuss. Uh, everybody has, has its say, so be ready to discuss and defend your case. Remember also that you're in a region where the people are, well, how you say that, the traders, they know how to drive a hard bargain. But it's always in a in a good good way. It's not aggressive, but it's just uh, sometimes with humor, sometimes with a drink, and in the end, there's the, the handshake. Always remember to get everybody in. The consensus building is important. They will take input from a lot of people, different people. Once a decision is taken, it's it's a deal can be verbal and it will be put in a, into a contract and it will be detailed, but it's considered a deal. And especially when it's when the contract is signed and you start still negotiating or changing, that's not taking very well. Well, the routes to market, I think it's, it's everywhere the same, direct exporting, you get higher control, of course, uh, higher profits, but Again, you need to put in your, your resources. Importer, distributor, it's an easy way, but less margin. A sales rep representative, the good thing is 
that he probably has other parts in his other products in his portfolio so you can go on the back of that uh the negative thing is that he might not put too much effort always in your product i think especially in the countries where this uh, collaboration is so important. A strategic partnership is a very good way. It's a win-win for everybody. But it, it, well, it starts always, of course, trust and compatibility. That's important, and that's what you need to put in some time and effort. The strong bonds, uh, there have been historical ties between Canada and the Netherlands, uh, the royal family, was during the war was in, a, in, 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 in Canada, stayed in Canada. One of the princesses was born there. And still every year, 10,000 tulip bulbs are sent to the tulip festival in Ottawa, for instance. So, uh, and plus after the war, a lot of Dutch people emigrated to Canada. So many Dutch people like myself have family in Canada. In Belgium, Belgium was liberated by the Canadian troops in 44. So that's remembered very well. So some of the companies that are already here, um, there's Clear Cable in the Netherlands. They set up a uh, European office in the, in the innovation hub, Greenport in Eindhoven. McCain, of course, because of the potatoes, they have a huge uh, operations in Belgium. Bombardier is here since a long, long time. Not for fly, not for planes, but for trains. And uh, well, we hope to be able to add your list on uh, your name on this list. So this gets me to the end of the presentation, in which I hope you got a bit better insight in how to do business in the Benelux. I hope you got the appetite to become active in Europe and use the Benelux as your gateway. And we will be very very happy to support and guide you in this journey and make it a successful experience. Thank you very much and hope to see you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Seed, for that informative presentation. That was great information for our Atlantic Canadian companies in the audience today. And it's great to have you joining us. Uh, I want to also welcome Marit uh, Sarfanord. Uh, perhaps uh, you could quickly introduce yourself to our audience. Thank you, Sean. Good morning uh, to uh, everyone present in the virtual online room. I'm happy to be here and uh, join you in this uh, uh, interesting, engaging program. My name is Marit Scharfenort, and the best way to remember me is literal tr translation of my last name is the sharp place. So don't forget, sharp notch, sharp place. Um, I've uh, joined OCO not too long ago, um, basically the beginning of the year um, as an independent uh, business consultant. And in that capacity, I assist uh, companies who want to enter the European market, specifically Benelux uh, and Germany. Uh, before joining OCO, I've uh, helped uh, tours of uh, companies uh, from uh, Israel and uh, Germany enter the Dutch market, and I've built a, a network in um, a variety of uh, industries and sectors like HLS, cyber, uh, telco, healthcare, new media, broadcast, and I've had the pleasure of working already with a couple of uh, uh, ACC companies and uh, enjoy working with them. Wonderful. It's great to, great to have you here with us today, Mary. Um, so oh, I'm just see, seeing on our end, we have been having some technical issues with Seed, so I am hoping that he's able to, to stay connected. But so it's even better that we have you here with us today, uh, Mary, to, to talk through uh, the questions that were com coming in from our audience. So to, to before we get into those, uh, we did have a poll uh, question uh, as part of the presentation that Seed gave today. So I'm going to quickly uh, jump into that to see the results, and then I'm going to get your reaction to that. Um, so if there's anyone last minute that wants to fill that out uh, as I'm stalling for time here, this is when you can, <laughs> can do that. Um, so the question today was, uh, how do you want to enter the European slash Benelux market? Uh, and we had several options, distributor, strategic partnership, uh, direct export, agent, establishing own operation, or other. And the response was a fairly uh, definitive uh, with 86% of respondents saying uh, distributor with uh, second place being a strategic partnership. 
So, uh, Marit, what, uh, what's your reaction to, to that kind of uh, overwhelming response on the dis distributor side? I'm, I'm positively impressed. Uh, um, I would say that uh, um, whoever is considered uh, entering uh, new markets has, uh, has done uh, his and her homework, so that's very good. Although I would not exclude that it is totally impossible to do the direct approach, especially if you have uh, uh, someone like, for example, OCO, um, uh, who can do sort of, um, if you're looking to enter these new markets, as a, uh, use us as a door opener, you know, and then uh, uh, with, with a distributor or agent representative, uh, you have uh, someone who knows the market, knows the language, and has the network and opportunities uh, to introduce you as a new company in the specific market. So I would say well done already. Excellent. We've we've had a good history on our, our virtual series so far. Our, our, the Atlantic Canadian companies have been giving very, very good, accurate responses right in line with what our experts are, are thinking. So <laughs> good to see that trend continuing. Um, so so that's great. Thanks so much for that. Um, now we're going to, oh, I, I believe we have uh, Seab back with us. I, I so think I'm back. <laughs> excellent. Let's, let's see if we can, uh, if technology will agree with us here today. So uh, thanks so much for the presentation and thanks for joining us today. Um, so per perfectly timed, we can start getting into some questions. Uh, I, again, I know there were quite a few questions we had um, that we weren't, weren't able to get to before the break with our, with our trade commissioner colleagues. So if uh, people had some of those questions they wanted to address to our, our friends here from OCO Global, please feel free to put those in the chat. Um, but I did, I did grab one of those questions to, to start us off today, and it's related to, to e-commerce. Uh, and which has obviously been a, a very hot topic as as COVID has had impacts on how uh, people look at their market entry strategies. So I'm wondering if uh, if you could both maybe comment on what what are some what's some advice or some some things that you would tell our our small company smaller companies here on the call today um, about if they're looking to enter the Benelux region using e-commerce. What advice would you give them on that? Um, I I would definitely um, recommend uh, to make sure that um, the website is not only available in English, but make sure to have it in, in the local languages, so in Dutch and in French in, in Belgium. I don't know if German is necessary for the Belgian market. The SIP can add to that, but uh, definitely those should be ready. And um, I think it's been mentioned before in the, the session before your break, um, it's important to have the right partners in place in, in, in the Benelux um, uh, who can help you get the product to the market. Because if you cannot deliver on time or you cannot offer the services, it'll be a very short uh, and not so very sweet experience. That would be my, my initial thoughts on, on, on the line. How do you feel about that, Steve? Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I agree with that. I think uh, it, it's, it's very important and, and especially the younger generation, they, they, they click on it and they want to have it uh, within 24 hours. So exactly. you need a good partner who can uh, who in, in the supply chain. I think, again, one thing that you have to keep in mind always is uh, don't look at the Benelux just for the Benelux market. But uh, if, you, if you have to translate it in French anyway, you can do the whole French market. If you exactly. translate it in German, you have the whole German market, of course. Uh, and and I think, the, yeah, so you, 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 you have a huge, huge market from here. I think that that's really one of the key points is that uh, the whole logistics is very well organized around here. Uh, the, the companies, both in Belgium and in, and in the Netherlands, they used to try to work international. They used to work with the other European countries. So make use of that. That's, uh, that's the main. Excellent. Yep, I can only corroborate that. Sorry to interrupt you. Sean. <laughs> No, that's excellent. It's better to hear from from you than from me. Uh, that's uh, no, that's excellent, uh, excellent advice. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, so, uh, another question that came in specifically for for you, Steve. Um, so, you had mentioned that um, in your presentation that meetings are important. Um, what would be your impression of uh, for for potential clients or partners in Benelux? Uh, how open are they to the to virtual meetings? And is there any advice on how to conduct those virtual meetings uh, well within the current context? Virtual, uh, well, uh, 
I don't think we have a lot of choice at the moment, so uh, you will have to do your, your meeting virtual. Uh, people are used to it, so uh, I, I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a problem. Uh, like I said, languages are quite good, I think, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's not really a problem uh, to do the, uh, the meetings in English. Um, one good thing also, and that's not just on virtual meetings, but on general, we've done, uh, well, one or two years ago, there was a kind of perception study on Canadian and, and uh, the Benelux countries. And it was very clear that Benelux com companies said they, they, they like to work with Canada, uh, especially if you compare it more to your southern neighbor. It's, it's a, the way of doing business and the way of, of uh, how people uh, act. Uh, that's much closer uh, with Canadians than, for instance, with, uh, with with the U.S. So, I think that's something else. It's it's it's, a, it's an easier fit. Yep. Perfect. Um, so another one that that came in here uh, from the audience, would, and sort of building off of that, considering we're in a virtual world, but uh, maybe if you could share both of you, if you could share a few ideas and maybe a bit of advice on how uh, a company exploring Benelux as a as a new market, how can they uh, start the process to to find a good partner, and in particular, how do they start building that relationship? I would, I would, uh, I would say um, all good uh, new ventures start with preparing. Um, so um, my advice is um, do, do your marketing, do your marketing research, do your due diligence, and as OCO, we we have the experience and 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 the manpower to to assist you with getting all the market relevant market information and trends and developments in place um that's definitely a prerequisite uh, to also know about competitors um is it really so new uh and um, uh, even if you know you have competitors in the european market doesn't mean uh, a no right away um you just need to find out what uh, what are your unique differentiators uh, and uh, then try to to um uh, polish that so you can present this uh, to your new potential partner or um, yeah, strategic partner or um, end user. And uh, especially in the Netherlands or Benelux, that, that works really well if you can see what is the added benefit of a particular product. So um, that is something I would definitely start with. And um, yeah, maybe Seep can continue. So I think I got yeah, stuck no. in the research. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, th I, th I think that's right. Um... What I think is important is, uh, and, and it was already mentioned in the presentation, and especially in the Netherlands, people are quite direct. So don't beat around the bush. Just just tell exactly. uh, tell what it is you you would like to do, uh, what your product or technology really does, what the advantages are, uh, cost wise, uh, quality wise. Uh, that's all, all, all possible. So I think um, be be open on that. Um, and, and again, uh, don't don't try hard sell on 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 uh, we're the best on this and just let the facts speak in, in that. I think that's that's very important. And I think there's a bit of a difference there, maybe between Belgium and the Netherlands. In Belgium, it will they think on a longer term often, a bit more strategically. So maybe in the Netherlands, you you will have an earlier response. Uh, but the Belgians, if they like it, they will come back and they will. Well, yeah, basically, I think uh, what what uh, Seep said, uh, it, it, it's it's all about um, showing the opportunity, not so much wanting, as he, uh, Seep said, the hard sell, but showing the opportunity it offers to both sides. You know, so yes, you want to sell your product, but uh, by selling a particular particular product, you can give value to uh, your new partner, and that's more to stress. Um, that works the best way in, in in building a new relationship in 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 these markets. Excellent. No, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, so we, we've got, had a few more, uh, you know, industry specific questions. I'm going to ask one here and it, it might be one uh, that might have to be taken offline, but I wanted to, to see if you had some initial responses to this one. Um, so there's a, one of our attendees today is a, is a manufacturer of uh, medical devices for the uh, veterinary industry um, and veterinary clinics. So it's, you know, implantable, non-active devices. Curious about if there are um, 
if there are regulatory requirements to register medical devices for the, the veterinary industry as opposed to the human health industry. Do you have any insights on that uh, immediately? Well, it's a, it's a good question. It, uh, it intrigues my, uh, my, it piques immediately my interest uh, into wanting to research it. Um, mm. I would assume uh, knowing the, the the European markets and the regulations that definitely it is um, yeah. there are rules and regulations in place, but I'd, I we'd have to look into that. Mm. So please no, reach I, out to us. Maybe yeah, Steve has. No, I, I think I think I think no, I, I I agree with you. I I I don't have the inside knowledge what exactly, but I I I cannot I cannot guess that there is no regulations needed because. Uh, uh, with medtech it's, it's always uh, the good thing is i think both in the netherlands uh, there's a very good uh, veterinary school in utrecht is the cluster for veterinary and in belgium you have uh, around ghent again you have a very good veterinarian school uh, belgium is also a center for horse breeding really at a high very high level bill gates's daughter she has a horses uh, here in belgium so it's really something uh, that 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 kind of that kind of medical uh, devices would be would be would be really uh, good to 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 have the man to hear about regulations like Howard says we'll be happy to uh, to, to to find it out too. Excellent, that's a really good insight. Thank you. Um, so one specifically for for you, Sieb, um, is there a, a, a different focus between the the ports of Antwerp and Rotterdam in terms of things like you know type of goods, bulk versus container, etc. Yeah, a little bit. Um, Rotterdam, Rotterdam is uh, is the largest. Rotterdam is by far the largest port. It's the largest port in in, in Europe. Uh, it's 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 Antwerp is the second largest, but there's quite a difference. Uh, but uh, Rotterdam port uh, has a lot still of bulk and oil and coal and, and uh, also of course a lot of container. Uh, Antwerp, we already said it, is a chemical hub. is a huge chemical hub. Uh, and has a lot of container. Um, and what Antwerp also has is that Antwerp is a uh, is quite inland. So before you get to the port of Antwerp, you have to go into the, the Skeld River. It's it's quite inland, but there are several ports. There's one on the coast with the Zeebrugge, which is, uh, for instance, the largest fruit port in Europe. And you have Ghent and Flushing. Flushing is on the Dutch side. Ghent is on the on the Belgian side. Again, there's a big uh, steel port, for instance. Um, so Antwerp has a bit of these hubs before you enter the, 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 the port itself. Uh, but to be honest, the port, like I said, it's, it's less than 100 km, kilometers away. Uh, there are pipelines, there are ships going, it's like buses going up and down. Uh, so you can almost consider it as one, one port. That's, that's, that's almost, it's one delta with two huge ports there and some sub ports. So, uh, there are, there are some differences, but um, you'll always you'll always uh, get your goods on the on the ground. Don't worry. Excellent, mm -hmm. wonderful. Thanks for that. And I think we've got time for for one more question. And I think we're gonna, probably going to end with a one that's going to be relevant for everyone. So I'd like to get uh, both of your insights on this. But I, uh, you know, as as the host of these events, I've seen quite a few of the same uh, companies attending and learning about our European markets, which is wonderful. So. A, a good uh, good opportunity for a bit of a sell in terms of why why should the the companies that are in attendance here today why should they consider doing business in the the, the Benelux countries? So maybe start with you, uh, Marit, and, and then go to see. Sure, I think that's a excellent question, and uh, I believe uh, uh, we heard uh, it already in 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 Sieb's, uh, uh, very uh, uh, to the point uh, presentation before uh, we had this live session. Um, uh, you, you you might think, oh, th there's three small countries, but uh, uh, all combined together, they are what we call them the unexpected powerhouse, and they have uh, the infrastructure in place. Uh, um, and I'm I'm talking not only about uh, the waterways, airways, uh, and the seaways, as we just uh, discussed, the ports, but also the the logistics in, in, in the services, you know, it's, it's, uh, they're both uh, seafarer nations. So trading, trading is in the genes. We are born with the trading gene, you know, and, and uh, that, that all facilitates the, 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 the tools 
uh, and 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 uh, the the infrastructure uh, for you to get the product not only in these markets but uh, as uh, it's been said with uh, the uh, colleagues from the trade uh, commission services if, uh, if it works in the Netherlands or in the Benelux, you know you you had your test bed, like Steve said, and you're ready to go to the rest of uh, the Europe and uh, uh, Germany, France, and further on. So I believe those are definitely, um, yeah, uh, the, the the most important uh, factors uh, to consider the Benelux market, and yeah. the fact that you can use English and French for the most part in in, in Belgium. No, I, uh, well, I think uh, Marit said most of it. Uh, I think one of the things is that uh, also, and it was mentioned before, is that um, people are open to new technologies, trying new products. Um, so, so as a test market is good. And of course, the people are very nice, as you can see. Yes, absolutely. You, you both made that very obvious today. So that's, that's, that's <laughs> excellent. Super. Um, well, that uh, I wish we had more time to, to, to chat. I've really enjoyed hearing your perspectives uh, on, on Benelux. Um, but I just want to say thank you to, to both of you for taking the time to be with us today to, to answer the questions from our audience. Uh, and I, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to, to speaking with both of you again soon. So thanks so much. Wonderful. Thank Pleasure thank was all ours. Thank you. Uh, we, uh, we hope to see all the companies coming uh, this way. Yes, oh, yeah, please yeah. reach out to us. Any questions you have or how we can help you. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.